All right. So I am 100%. Um, I know that like we're the last thing between uh, you and the happy hour. Um, <laughs> so I'm still going to take 30 minutes, though, so like you can sit down. You want to just go and start <laughs> drinking? No. Um, but I'm really excited for, for this for this Farisat chat. Uh, so I'm JV, co-founder at, at Plato, and it's, it's an honor to be with you, Tamar, today. Uh, I've known you for six, seven years now since the beginning of Plato as like an advisor, customer, coming to you with like new features every two years and kind of still putting up with us. So I'm glad that we can go over your, your career, uh, 12 years at Box from software engineer to now VP. So I think that's what we're going to try to cover in this half hour before happy hour. It's really, you know, what was this career like? So um, yeah, feel free to quickly introduce yourself and then we'll start, you know, uh, in a timeline way. So from your first. Yeah. Fantastic to be here with you all. I feel like Elevate is such an awesome conference. I always learn so much from everyone, uh, just hearing about all our experiences and how we've accomplished what we've accomplished. So excited to hang out with JB today and hopefully have a good conversation. Yeah. So let's start from the top, right? PhD. <laughs> yes. In theoretical computer science, very practical, formal language theory, Super intense, no coding involved. It's basically math, um, although it was technically in the CS department, so I, I get to say that I have a, a PhD in computer science. And then yeah. desire to go to the industry. Yeah, so it, it's a, you know, maybe a weird choice. I actually, um, after, my first, after I finished my first year of undergrad, I started working at a startup company, um, just very small. I think I was like employee 17 at the time. Uh, and I kind of worked summers there and part-time sort of a elongated internship. I even took a semester off uh, to work there and I really loved it. Um, and yet I took a complete pause and decided to do the, the PhD thing for a bit. Um, Cause I, I don't know, I just wanted that opportunity to really dive into a hard challenge like all the way to the depths of it. Uh, but when I finished, I was pretty clear that I wanted to go back to industry. Um, and in fact, I really wanted to go back to that startup environment. So I was explicitly looking to join as a software engineer at a small kind of early stage company. And I got a lot of quizzical looks when people looked at my resume. They were like, you realize this is not a research position? Because <laughs> I had a little bit of a strange background, but uh, thankfully found Box and yeah. So how did this happen? <laughs> how did I, yeah, how do you find a startup? So uh, it, I, I met the folks from Box when I crashed a career fair at Stanford. Um, at, at the advice of my husband, and I was pretty worried because I'm like, I'm not a student, and I'm not a student at Stanford, and I'm not looking for an internship, and he's like, you should just go. Um, and it was great because it was an opportunity to actually talk to people um, and explain my background, explain what I was looking for. So I met the folks from Box and uh, interviewed, and yeah, ended up, ended up joining. Yeah, so what was the team? So what's really interesting is that the team you joined 12 years ago is still part of now uh, you know, your org. Well, sort of. So um, let's see. I, Box was actually a little on the large side of what I was looking for. They were um, about at 130 people, but only 30 in engineering. So I was telling myself, OK, I'll, I'll still kind of have that experience of, of knowing everyone and, and um, having the flexibility to find my path. I think for me, startup was a lot about, I, I didn't have a clear notion of where I wanted to head to. And I had learned from my previous experience that you come to this sort of uh, chaotic world <laughs> of startups, you can sort of end up doing uh, uh, unexpected things. Um, so yeah, so it was a 30 person engineering team. I joined uh, the back end engineering team, which was six people. Um, I was the first woman on the team, uh, which was fun. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was uh, definitely a different phase of the company. Um, but we, we started sort of growing uh, somewhat rapidly, maybe around six months into my time there. And when I hit my four-year mark, we had roughly 10x in terms of employees. Um, so that was an interesting, an interesting adventure for sure. Uh, but I joined as an engineer and somewhat randomly uh, ended up working on building out our first scalability layer for our database tier. Uh, so when I joined, we were basically running on effectively a single database uh, at any given time, a SQL database. Um, and that was still working, which is surprising, but was not quite working. And you can kind of see uh, where we were headed. So 
um, ended up building out our sort of sharding infrastructure and our, our, uh, the foundations of our uh, database service layer. Uh, and when we finished that project, uh, it was a little more complicated. It needed a little more continued work. And I basically advocated that we should build a team uh, to own that. And yes, that, that, the evolution of that team is, is still a part of my team today, which is fun. So right at that time, this is pretty much when you made the decision to go into management yeah. uh, at that moment. So like two years in? Yes. Almost, yeah, yeah, it was about two years in. Uh, I debated it a fair amount. Um, you know, we all have that like stay on the technical track or go into management. And uh, I actually got a lot of uh, surrounding feedback to, to stay on the technical track. There was this uh, uh, meme that managers aren't technical. Um, but I don't know. I had this sense that it would be a bigger departure to go into management, and I was curious. Uh, I wanted to see what it was like, and so I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And worst case, I, I told myself I could always go back. I'd al already like uh, had one of the, okay, go into theory, come back to practice, so I wasn't too scared to go into management and, if need be, uh, go back to being an IC, and I, I felt it would probably give me a more well-rounded view of um, what goes into building an engineering team successfully. Uh, but I, I switched into a management role and ended up loving it and, and never never switched yeah. back. So. And you told me that like Box secretly thought you would not <laughs> yes, uh, end up I, as a manager. Yeah, I, I, there was uh, shaky confidence in my conviction here. So they, they actually, I, I went up for a promotion to a, uh, a manager title and they ended up giving me like a staff engineer title at the same time um, and, the, and the narrative was in case I decided I want I wanted to go back they they wanted to make sure I had the right level to return to so I was like okay this is uh, sure if you guys want to um, no. but it, it didn't end up uh, using that yeah. Yeah. Then it kind of ended up working out and then yes. as, as, as you know opportunistically uh, opened up more teams under you right yeah, so management is funny in that it's very opportunistic. Like you can't manage a team that doesn't exist or doesn't need a manager. And so um, there's some amount of organically growing the team that you have. And then there's some amount of, you know, someone quit or, or, or someone um, took a different role and, and there's a gap somewhere in the organization you need to take it on. So I think I've had an interesting mix over the years of, um, growing teams, but also taking on teams. And it's, it's an interesting experience. You, you definitely learn more um, you know, when you take on a new team. And, and it's, it's kind of like running more than one experiment at a time. Um, but one of the interesting processes for me each time has been trying to figure out whether the, the combined team made sense. Like I think sometimes if you're on a management track, it feels like you should be optimizing for scope. And, and for number of people that you manage, but not all scope is created equal. If, if you're managing two teams that don't really have a, a strong yeah. relationship with each other, then it doesn't, it, the fact that you're managing both of them doesn't give you any leverage. It doesn't give those teams any leverage. It's basically you're doing double, uh, 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 double the job, right? And so, it, 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 yes, there's a certain element of like accelerating your learning by doing double the job, but also you're not really doing the bigger job. Uh, and so whenever I've taken on a team, I like to think of it a little bit, almost like a systems view, right? Does this, does this make sense into sort of a bigger unit with, from which I have more leverage or more ability to, to align strategy or, 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 or to uh, provide sort of a, um, a rationalization for the scope? Um, if so, great. If not, my job is to basically refactor them out of my team and figure out like what's yeah. a better home, where's a place that they can align. Yeah. So I've done a lot of like take on, but then also um, ship out, uh, in including like even I, I remember um, at one time kind of like cutting my team in half and handing off 40 people, which if you're managing 80 people, handing off 40 is like a big, big change. I had a I admit I had a little bit of cold feet <laughs> as I was doing that, but I kept telling myself like this team doesn't make sense. I'm not really going to be able to, to support these yeah. two organizations. And so it's a really, working out well. it's a really good learning for everyone here. Who's yeah. most people here managing in some ways, like, you know, think about like, do your team make sense? Like, can you build a narrative around, you know, the people that are under you. And if not, you know, as you said, how you refactor yeah. them. It's interesting how you can, you know, the parallel with actually, you know, technology and yes. like, you know, how you build infrastructure and in, 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 in all of this where it needs to make sense. Yep. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and so 
um, you know, we, we talk about, you know, suddenly you have one team, suddenly you have two and, and, and three, and like, um, okay, great, but you were good at it, you know, otherwise you <laughs> wouldn't yeah. have gotten more teams. So what do you think made you successful in, in those years and, and maybe even now in those so I think when you first sort of switch into management, it, it, it's very much a different role, and you almost have to re-understand what it is that you do on the team. Like, how do I? The first time you sit down you're, to write your uh, self-evaluation, like, what do you put down there? You didn't ship the code. You don't want to take credit. Like, it, it, it's 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 a strange perspective shift. Um, I think we also. Um, I, and I actually didn't quite understand this myself. You know, you switch into management and you're like, oh, now I am all of these people's manager. You were, you were yourself, you were an individual, you had a manager, you had all these expectations from what you're, you want your manager to be for you. And you become a manager and you're like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that for everyone. So you become the amazing coach of, I don't know, the five people that you have on your team. Um, and weirdly enough, uh, although coaching and investing people is an important part of the role, like that's not the job. So a little ways in, I, I basically realized that you sort of shift into understanding that you now own this, this scope, right? And this scope is expected to deliver business impact. And as a manager at any level, but also as a first line one, it, it's all about how you maximize impact. A lot of that is about maximizing the abilities of your team. So for sure, the, the people element and the met coaching and mentorship comes in. But, but really sort of shifting the perspective to think, how can I take this scope that I've been entrusted with, align people, facilitate their ability to execute well, facilitate how they interface with the other parts of the organization, how are we surfacing information, how are we receiving information, and, and focusing on impact. That, in my mind, is the best way to, to progress yeah. because if people see that when they give you a team, the result of that is a team that delivers impact, which also, by the way, implies a healthy team um, and a team that's executing well, but a team that delivers impact, they're like, okay, we can entrust this person with more. And I think you, you build, again, you build the trust of the organization in you as a leader slowly over time, um, and that's what leads to more and more of those opportunities. It's kind of getting away from I'm managing those five people to like yeah. I'm managing this scope and I'm accountable for the impact yes. that the organization kind of asked me to, to deliver on. Yeah. I think it's a really good advice and a new way of thinking about management. And then the people are obviously a major part of it. That yeah. They're the ones that are going to help you deliver the scope yeah. and then that their job is not to manage them. So that's really but, but even like what do we all want, right? It, it, sometimes people think it's almost we put the, like you're either investing in your people or you're like a shill for the business. But, but if we think like what do we actually want on teams, we want to know that we're working on something of value that's delivering impact to the business, that we understand why what we do matter matters, that, that we have the context that we need to do our job well. All of that comes from having a manager that owns their scope and sets that context for their team. And yes, within that also provides the coaching and perspective and growth mm -hmm. uh, on an individual level. But it's it sort of, it, what, you know, whatever you're solving for, it all aligns together. The success of the people on the team and the success of the team, they, 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 can't, they can't go no. not hand in hand. So for, you know, fast forward now, uh, after the engineering manager, there's the senior EM. If you look at Tamar's LinkedIn, it's very <laughs> straightforward, uh, like the titles. Um, they removed the staff at this point, I think. Yes. It was understood that, you know, the management... I go back to IC, right. I could still yeah. be a staff engineer. So. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, how would you, would you describe the senior EM role? So um, the... Manager that I had at Box uh, when I joined for many years um, was great, and he had these like clear ways of framing things. And so we always used to say that um, uh, whenever there's like a, a title name, that is a new role, and if it's the senior version, and it's just kind of like the expert mode of that same role. So if manager, you're usually you're just starting out, you're managing a team. 
senior manager, you've built up more experience, either there's something more complex or, or more um, high impact, high risk about the particular team that you're managing, or oftentimes you're managing maybe a couple of adjacent teams, um, so you have sort of a larger scope, maybe you're starting to manage other managers because you've built up that expertise and so you can start training others. So sort of, to me, senior manager is, is very much this, the same role, but on a more advanced level. Um, and that's also kind of what, what was reflected for me in, in my path. And so quickly after that, uh, kind of the directorship uh, happened. Yeah. Uh, and so what was the transition? What do you think you know, made this happen at Box? So for me, the shift with director is that you really need to start driving. And it's, it's not that you can't influence or contribute to strategy at the manager or senior manager, even the individual uh, engineer level, right? Like we should all be thinking about why are we doing what we're doing, but at the director level, that now becomes a part of the job expectations, right? You need to understand the broader context of the or organization within which you're operating, and you need to understand how to, how to um, set the strategy for your team within that broader context, again, to maximize impact. Um, and so, for me, there was an element of, again, you just, you gotta build up experience and, and manage more teams and manage larger teams and build up the trust uh, uh, from the organization that you can do that. Um, I also had an opportunity to lead sort of a, a larger cross-functional effort that was scoped larger than the team that I officially managed. Um, and showing that I was able to pull that together and, and deliver impact with sort of this broader scope, I think was another um, uh, element of, of trust, uh, uh, showing that I could, I could uh, drive at that more advanced level. And I think that was also, ended up being a big part of, of the yeah. director promotion. It's a good lesson as, as well, right? Where you basically almost did the director job yeah. kind of before getting the, the title. And, and, and sometimes we, hear that you know you, you should do what you're paid for or you should do what your titles tells you right and and yeah there's truth to that but there's also like you know taking opportunities as well within companies and good companies will recognize that at, yeah. at some point like yeah i think you always want like again when presented an opportunity to to really step up and take it but even just as a personal learning and growth opportunity, right? Like you, you have a chance to learn from something that's put in front of you, why not? Uh, and again, another opportunity to show that you are a leader that the organization can trust to deliver. Um, I mean, if you're, if, you're in a, if you're in an organization that doesn't over time recognize your, your impact, then you know, the, no one's forced to stay where they are. Um, but uh, I think Sometimes we think too much of like, what does it take to get to the next level? Like we're aiming for the next thing. And I find that that often actually ends up being more confusing and leads to actions that where it almost feels like you're trying to, you know, check a box on whatever your career rubric or career ladder is. And it's almost like when you're uh, <laughs> driving a car, you don't look at <laughs> where you are, you look ahead. So it's, it's, it's all about trying to, within the, where you are, what are the opportunities that you can step up to? What are the ways in which you can influence? It doesn't always even have to be an official leadership. Uh, uh, you know, someone doesn't come and say, hey, you go do this thing. Like, you're in a team that needs to figure something out. How can you contribute? How can you help drive in a good direction? And that compounds over time. And then, and then at some point you realize like, oh, I'm already doing the job. And if you're in a good organization, then you'll, you'll be recognized yeah. for that. And then expert mode of that senior director, Yep. Um, what can you say, like, how was it different? Was it more like a smooth transition to that role? Yeah, I th again, scope? I think it was, again, expert mode. So just, you know, bigger team, more, more, more experience, um, really. So I, I was always that person that was thinking a little bit of like, why are we doing what we're doing? And again, showing some of that um, strategic thinking even earlier, but there's a difference where, again, you're accountable for something, so being able to really lean into that and think about um, what should my team be working on and, and how, to, how, how can I stretch them further, like finding a way to balance. You know, we all 
set goals for our teams and it's so easy to like overshoot or undershoot. So, you know, finding a, um, honing that skill of knowing how to challenge a team while staying connected to what's realistic um, and, and building up um, a stronger leadership team under me. Like I think that's also a really important element of becoming more senior is to, to build a team that enables you to operate at a higher level. Um, and again, an another sort of cross-functional, <laughs> different cross-functional effort. Yeah. Um, uh, somehow everything I've, folks who know me from Box don't know that I've weirdly had a career of migrating us from one thing to another. So we were, we were going through a, a large migration that um, I was able to, to lead. And uh, that also, I think, kind of yeah. showed once again sort of leadership at a broader scale. I think we met, when we met you, we were at the senior director position, I think, yeah. uh, back then. And then uh, I think it was four years ago, right, that you yeah. know you were promoted to um, uh, VP, as uh, Bonnie said, like, you know, it's no feat. So, you know, con congrats on, on, on that. And, and so how did that happen uh, as well? What uh, a step function as well on that uh, title change? Yeah, so that one is definitely, again, a new role. Um, and... Interestingly, I actually got the promotion without necessarily getting sort of another team or more scope. Like it wasn't a situation like that. So I, I actually became a VP with a relatively small team. Mm -hmm. Just remember, I cut my team in half. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was like a, uh, compared to my peers, I, I felt like I was um, uh, sort of starting with a, with a smaller team. Um, but I think really understanding, it, it's almost like what is a constraint that you need to solve for versus what is the scope that you're accountable for and can actually influence shifts every time. And so I, I think I was still in this mode of like, you know, uh, um, uh, trying to follow some, some process or some decree from a non-existent uh, VP until I realized it was me. I was like, oh, if my team is scrambling at the last minute to finish our planning or to align on some decision or to figure out our headcount, like that's because I haven't actually set sort of a structure and a process for us to be able to do that. So, it, you know, creating space uh, um, for the leaders that report into me to be able to drive their organizations but still giving ourselves an opportunity to come together as a team for me to influence what they're doing and to weigh in. So it, it really required sort of um, changing, changing that perspective. It, um, it took me a little bit to understand yeah. what the role was, <laughs> but it's been fascinating. Would you say that like it's manager and director is more operating and thriving within the constraints and as VP you're like, I'm, I'm actually setting up the constraints or like setting the deadlines, for I, example? I think it's all, always like, it, 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 it shifts again, right? So, so with a manager, senior manager, generally, generally you've been given roughly what you're supposed to do. And so now it's more about how do I break this down into something that I can execute on? How do I set my team up? How do I track that execution? How do I, at the same time, also make sure that all the systems that I own are healthy and, uh, and so forth? Um, and then director is a bit more on okay, how, what are we gonna do? Like, what is the set of things that I need all of these teams together to do so that we can deliver on this impact that we need for the year? Understanding what that impact should be, but also kind of what are the, the steps and components and, and elements that go into that. Um, and then I think with VP, there's, m some of it is just thinking further out. Um, um, so like what, you know, how, if you have your directors thinking more in the like one to two year range, you, you have to be stretching out a little further than that and creating some sort of coherent narrative for, again, you, I want the team to make sense as a team, so creating some coherent narrative that helps everyone focus and align their efforts. Um, and then more on the structure and the ways in which we work. And then of course, just operating I'm a big belie believer in teams and so, you sort of become a, at least at Box, you become a member of the leadership team for engineering. So thinking of the engineering team as a whole and, and now how do we operate successfully and what do we do um, as an organization. Yeah. Yeah. And so if we, in hindsight, you know, there's the engineer to EM, EM to director, director to VP, you know, what, was, what, what were the biggest step functions for you and what were maybe the smoothest uh, transitions? For me, the weirdest ones to wrap my head around were the first time I became a manager, because again, I think that's very much a perspective shift. Yeah. Um, and then I think the VP one, again, was yeah. a, a bigger perspective shift yeah. for me. It took me. Took me time to like not be 
frustrated by, and actually realized that I had a lot more control over my own destiny in the role in ways that I didn't realize initially. And then it kind of became fun because then you're like, oh, now I can, I can actually set this up, set this up yeah. well for, for my And team. the director transition was more like yeah. you were kind of doing the job before. Yeah, uh, that one getting felt better. more smooth. smooth. Yeah. Um, so it's been four years now. Mm -hmm. as a VP at, 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 at Box. So again, if you look at Tamar's LinkedIn, it's very, very consistent. Every two years promotion. So what is going on, right? <laughs> uh, and so, you know, now what? You know, what's, yeah. uh, what, what's the future for, for you? It's, it's funny because also, um, uh, especially when I hit my 10 years, actually, all of a sudden you get asked by all these people, like, okay, it's, it's been 10 years. Like, what's going on? Um, just goes to show that it's not all about getting the next title. Um, uh, for me, the opportunity to do something that I find challenging and that I feel like I'm learning and growing from has always been front and center. And um, we've we've uh, we just completed a massive uh, migration of all of our infrastructure to the cloud, uh, which is probably funny for um, uh, any earlier is it like newer companies because you know since I guess 2007 or so yeah. there's no such thing as an on-prem to cloud migration, but. Box was founded in 2005, so um, so that was a, a really just fascinating like uh, um, next step on this insane journey of you know starting from the stack that we had when I joined and everything that we've been building up to um, uh, build in more scalability and we had a talk here on platforms right building in the right platforms and building in the right capabilities and then also evolving our, our environment so that was really fascinating yeah. and I learned a lot and um, now I, I, I don't know I'm very excited about a lot of what we're working on uh, on our roadmap and uh, it's it's funny like I, AI is such a hype cycle right now but also if you think of what box does with us dealing with unstructured content. It's kind of like a technology that is uh, very yeah. appropriate. So having an opportunity to take something that's so hyped, but actually thinking about how to productize it in an at-scale product with an established enterprise uh, customer base is also a fascinating challenge. So for now, I'm having a ton of fun, and I'm OK with uh, <laughs> the, the LinkedIn uh, ladder not updating uh, every two years. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how things go. So, sounds good. Um, so yeah, I think that pretty much wraps it up. You know, from like a, a timeline perspective. You know, if, if I want to remember some of the learnings here, uh, one of them is really about when you build uh, your team. So don't you know try to get as much scope. It's more about like trying to build a narrative about the the organization under you you're, you're building. Uh, another one is being uh, like taking the opportunities uh, when they come up, even if you don't have the title, title like how do you get um, more, more, more scope? The other one is about, you know, do not see yourself as the manager of people, but manage, manage a scope and be accountable for a scope and use the people to kind of achieve that. Um, and I'm guessing the last one is really stop chasing titles um, and, and really looking for impact and good companies overall will recognize that. And if not, then maybe time to, to, to move on. Um, we have a couple of minutes, and so I just wanted to, you know, quick, quick fire questions. Uh, so um, I'm going to steal it. I think Bonnie asked it the, the whole day about, uh, you know, what's your favorite two or three books you would recommend uh, for the audience here? I first off recommend just like as many books and podcasts and, and awesome events like this. I, I think we're in this fascinating field that is not this like super well-established only one way to do things. So the more you learn from others' experience, I think it all just feeds into our knowledge. Um, a couple though that, I'll answer the question. Uh, when I first became a manager, um, my manager at the time recommended I read uh, First Break All the Rules. And I like that as a book because it sort of explains the fact that your job as a manager is not to be a one size fits all fair person who's trying to like work with everyone on their weaknesses. I felt like it sort of gave me permission to look at my team for who they were and figure out how how to like set them up in the best way to get the most out of what we were trying to accomplish. And so I think it was sort of, at, le at least for me initially framing a good one. Um, and then I already said big believer in teams. Actually the thing that helped me understand what my role as a manager was, was five dysfunctions of, the t of a team. And talking about yep. this notion of first teams, like a leadership team being your team. I think that's the foundation for all of our jobs. So it's, it's not a, a snazzy new book, but I think it's a, it's a classic for a reason. 
Cool. Last one, we've got 50 seconds. Is there still some of your code in production right now, Adbox, 12 years later? Uh, I'm going to guess yes. There's some folks here uh, <laughs> from Box that probably have, uh, can go check the code base. But uh, yes, I, I can't imagine it's all gone. But for what it's worth, every time something I built uh, gets replaced by the team, I am, this is like my moment of uh, maximal pride it's because it just, it just shows, you know. Code is, it's aging as soon as you put it in production. It, all of our jobs are about this sort of dynamic adjustment towards where we're heading. Um, and if you're not adjusting your code base and, and, and your architecture and your systems and your platforms and your teams, if we're not all refactoring everything on an ongoing basis, it means that we've stagnated. Um, and so I'm, I always love seeing when, when uh, my code gets deprecated. Cool. That was it. Thank you very much, Tamar, Thank for you. this talk, for the honest conversation and, and the advice. Thank you.